Hallelujah. And I just take that to be a blessing on my life right there. But we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I want to begin by having you read with me from God's Word out of Colossians chapter 2. We'll begin with verse 13. Now, wait. I don't ever again want us to lightly regard what's about to happen right here. This is God's eternal word. This word sets captives free. This word breaks bondage. This word raises the dead. And when it comes out of my mouth, something changes in my life. So I want you to read with me vigorously, faithfully, beginning with verse 13. I think they have it there. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Amen. Father, once again, I'm overwhelmed at the task of trying to expound, even explain your word. So I'm asking for divine enablement. And I also recognize that it's not just how I say it, but how people hear it. Thank you that it will be done for your name's sake and fruit will be born. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> and before I get to that, I want to read from Psalm 112. Um, really two verses, just two. And I feel that I can stick my hand in the middle of this watermelon and pull out this middle here. This is what the Lord laid on my heart. Psalm 112 is, is what a righteous person can expect. When you honor God, when you are the righteousness of God, you can expect this whole chapter. But I want to read this verse. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid. What a word for today, for right now. What a comfort for us in this hour. Evil tidings are everywhere. That's about all I've heard for months and months. Evil tidings. We live, as I said to the early service, all this heaviness in the air, that's not just humidity. There's a spirit of fear that has gripped this nation. We are breathing that spirit of fear and anger. Our world has become fearful and angry. And that's a perfect storm. This book tells you and me, I'm not preaching to sinners today. I'm preaching to my brothers and sisters. And this book tells us how we are to deal with these evil tidings. That when we trust in the Lord and remain steadfast, bad news doesn't bother us. But we're living in a very fearful day. I don't want to go into statistics I've heard. I don't want to expound on any of that. I want to be as simple, as concise as I know how to be this morning. Everywhere you turn, people are afraid. They're afraid of uh, the next announcement, the next restriction, the next prohibition, the next mandate, uh, 
They're afraid of what's going to happen at school, if there is going to be a school. People are afraid what's going to happen downtown, uptown, everywhere. And with that fear comes this sense of, I have to defend myself. And anger becomes, it comes to the fore. We have been privileged by godless media to see everything that's wrong and bad multiplied. And we become angry ourselves. We've seen things blown out of proportion and lopsided reporting. And we find ourselves angry. And I told my staff last Tuesday in a prayer meeting right in this building, this is a very important Sunday coming up, August 16th, because the people that left 22 weeks ago won't be the same people that will be back today. Because we will have been through a pandemic and are still going through it, and we will have seen images and things that have incited all kinds of emotions and fear that have made us angry people about something. And that is what we will live in. That will be our atmosphere if we don't realize something. And I've come to tell you this morning that there is an answer. There is a solution for the fear and anger that is permeating our world. And that answer is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the answer, the solution that will put everything in perspective. But more than that, for us, it reminds us that Christ alone is Lord of this universe and of this world. That he is totally sovereign. He is in charge. Satan is not. The government is not. People are not. Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he's over this situation and he understands everything about it. But until we get back to the knowledge that the cross is the solution to every problem we face... And the answer to life, we will breathe their air, talk their words, and express their emotions rather than what Christ has done for us. So, so what is the cross? The cross is where God settled the issue for himself for eternity. He didn't just save me from my sins, but he reconciled his world back to himself. This is bigger than me just kneeling in the altar and getting saved. This is about the God of all creation, the mighty everlasting God who has now made provision to reconcile his world back to him that was tainted by sin. It's to jerk it out of the control of Satan's hand who momentarily took it because Adam and Eve sinned and death came in and started to reign. But here's where the news gets good. You see, until Jesus died and rose again, death was the bad boy on the block. Death was the biggest tool that Satan had. He intimidated people from the beginning with the fear of death. But the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ has delivered those who through fear of death were their whole lifetime subject to bondage. And having broken the power of death, he has set us free from worry and fear. Let me explain to you just for a moment, the best I know how, what happened on the day that Jesus was crucified. You've got to see, you have to see that Satan mustered all of his hellish ideas, his vengeance, his vitriol, his hatred for God, he amassed all of his devilish, dark, damnable angels and through wicked, ignorant, sinful man, all the powers of evil gathered together and they crucified Jesus and nailed him to a cross and left him there to hang between heaven and hell to hang there in front of eternity and invisible powers and spirits and wicked men and women 
and a weeping mother and disappointed disciples. There he hung. You have to understand this verse now in a different light. You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive. With him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The Bible says, when I believed in Christ, I died with Christ. I was raised with Christ. I've ascended with Christ. I'm in heaven now with Christ. I have Christ's victory. I live in his power. I have his spirit. I walk by his word. Do you understand what happened on the cross? He died for all of our sins. The sins of the whole world, past, present, future. And if you sit here today and call Jesus Lord, you've been forgiven of all your sins. I hate to yell like this all the time. I, but he did more than that. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. That means the law of God, the demands of God that were against us. No man could have kept them. No man could have perfectly kept the law of Moses. Only Jesus could do that. But when Jesus died, he perfectly fulfilled the requirements and the law of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he wiped them out. They were against us. And he has taken it out of the way. I no longer have to stand and look at a book of rules and see if I can keep them or keep holy days or feast days or fast days. I've already been set free by what Christ did on the cross. He took it out of my way and he nailed it to the cross. Everything that was against you was nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. Here it is, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Now listen, everything hell had was thrown at Christ. And Jesus not once said, this isn't fair. I've done nothing wrong. This is unjust. In fact, Isaiah 53 said he did not open his mouth to defend himself. It says, as a lamb before her shearers is dumb or closed mouth, so he opened not his mouth. Hell is screaming. All of the darkness yelling spiteful, damning things towards Jesus. Sinful mankind spitting at him belittling him, laughing at him. And the Son of God said not one word, nor did he lift one finger to defend himself. He simply said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. No man is doing this to me. I've come to lay myself before you. He took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And being in the likeness of sinful flesh, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. The devil didn't kill him. Mankind didn't kill him. His father let him willingly die. And when he died, when his head dropped, when the sky got dark, hell had a party. We did it. We did it, we did it. And for three days they danced and jigged and romped and parted and threw down. But three days later, Jesus Christ, you didn't hear me, did you? On the third day, Jesus Christ blinked and sat up and walked out. You talk about making a public spectacle of your enemy. You talk about humiliating the devil. When the devil did everything he had and Jesus did nothing and walked out, when the devil gave it his best shot, but it still wasn't enough, when hell was screaming and Jesus was silent and walked out on the third day, let me tell you, the devil has never been more humiliated in all of his existence. But here's what I want to tell you. 
having disarmed principalities and powers. Brother, sister, the devil has no weapons. He's been defamed. He's been defamed. And he's been disarmed. He has no weapons. He lost them when Jesus rose on the third day. Satan has no power over you or me. None. Not one bit of authority. He cannot touch me. The only power he has is the power I give him with my thought life, with my emotions, with my words. He's, you know, he has little alligator arms. If he had a sword, he couldn't reach it. He has nothing with which to come against me except insinuations, lies, and accusations. And he can do that all day long as long as I let him. I will open up my mind to him if I'm not careful by watching the news. Oh, and then the, when the evil tidings come over the news, then we get afraid. I, brother, this may sound really radical to y'all. As a child of God, you ought not to dirty up your ears or your mind ever again with filthy news, politics, and all the stuff that goes along with it. We ain't read, excuse my grammar, we haven't read the Bible enough to be indulging in hours of news every day. And the reason we get afraid when evil tidings come, uh, we've not been established in this. We're not strengthened in this. And then when the devil comes, who has been disarmed, and begins to say things, he incites us to cry out. It's not fair. I'm going to get mine. I want vengeance. I want justice. When your Lord never did that and was victorious. The devil gets you to think that you've got to fight. Fight your own battles. Jesus never fought his own battles. He said, everything the Father gives me, I speak. Everything the Father tells me to do, I do it. And the Father let him go to the cross. Jesus didn't resist. He didn't say, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to fight me. He said, in fact, I could call 10 legions of angels right now and they would come and deliver me. But that's not what I came to this world to do. So you remember this. If you're trying to mimic your Lord, you won't be a, a fighter. You won't be after revenge. You will let God fight your battles. You will let God take care of the situation. And you will trust God that on the third day, your enemy will be under your feet. Well, I read this the other day. The Spirit spoke to me about it. Paul writes to Timothy and says, I would that men and women everywhere lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Oh, wrath and doubting. That's what we call doubt and fear. That's what we call fear and anger. It's the same thing. I would that men everywhere would lift up holy hands without fear, without doubting, without wrath. And I, as I ponder those words, I just saw it. I don't, I don't know, I just saw it. Did you know in the Bible, God always extends an open hand? Did you know in the Bible, there's no such thing as a fist? The open hand represents blessing, honesty, integrity, holiness, compassion. The fist represents anger, wrath, malice. And what I'm afraid is happening in these days in the church among some Christians is that when we come to pray, we're lifting up fists. We're angry about something. Somebody. We're even angry at God. And when he says, come to me, and Paul says, lift up your holy hands, 
He didn't mean this. You see, the fist represents a militant attitude, an anger of anger. You, you can't shake somebody's hand with a fist. It nullifies fellowship. You can't pick somebody up with your fist. It keeps you from helping. Why, when you go to a court of law and put your hand on the Bible and raise the other one, you don't raise a fist. Because that hand represents I'm open, I'm honest, and what comes out of me is truth. When we come to God, we have to come saying, I'm hiding nothing. Sometimes when we come with our fists closed, we're saying, I'm coming to you, but in case you don't fix it, I got something in here. I'll fix it myself. You know, when, when a policeman confronts you, you don't go, oh, hey, all right. You, you do this. I do. <laughs> right? You get stopped by the police. You don't grab the stern heel with fists like this. You say, hey, look. In that way, we're saying, I'm not a threat. You don't have to worry about me. Someone told me just before I came in here that they think that the handshake in America came because of the Old West. Everybody carried a gun. And so they would come into town and every, you know, they'd wear their guns under their coats and they would do this to say, I don't have a gun. I'm not a threat to you, my, my friend. I'm trying to make a point here this morning that if you listen to Satan and his lies, the one who has been stripped of his power and has no weapons except what I give him? If you listen to him, instead of being able to say, I worship the Lord, I bless the Lord, I have nothing up my sleeve. If God doesn't help me, nobody else can. I come in peace, oh my God. I come to you, my brother, in peace. But if you listen to Satan, those those hands will start withering and twisting into fists. If you listen to this society, if you listen to the people who run this country and this world, if you listen to anybody except the truth, it'll change your whole attitude about the way you're supposed to be living. Oh, if I could get it across. Can, am I able to get this across to anybody? The, the devil, your enemy, your adversary has been disarmed. He has nothing with which to fight you. He cannot defeat you. It's up to you, my brother, whom you listen to. They will make you mad. He will give you peace and truth. Their evil tidings will upset you. But when you're in him and you're steadfast in him, their evil tidings cannot move you one iota. You can hear it and say, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, Jesus is in charge of my life. Oh, but pastor, we don't know what's going to happen next. I do. How arrogant is that? I can tell you right now, you ought to get ready for this. The world is getting worse. It's not going to improve. You can't make a dead tomato fresh again. You can't take a tree that's died and pump life into it. You can't reverse the aging process. You can't reverse the evil process. It's going to get worse. Jesus said that. The entire Bible proclaims that. And one of these days, I see, I still believe in the rapture of the church. I don't know about some of you, uh, but I've studied this for over 50 years. You can't change my mind about it. I already know what's going to happen next in my life. It could happen today. Oh, I wish it would happen today. A trumpet's going to sound and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be gathered with the saints that have gone on before us. We're going to go into heaven. All hell's going to break loose on earth. The man of sin is going to appear. He's going to deceive Israel. He's going to put a mark on people. They are going to be confused. They are going to be damned. And when the world gets to the place that it looks like it's absolutely 
undone. The sky is going to split. The king is going to appear on a white horse. He's coming back to set this old world right. You can expect that. Until he does, we're supposed to be living in this word right here. With all of my being, with all of my soul, I want to come to God like this. I have to be careful, you know, how I say things. Everybody's sensitive these days. Everybody. You can't believe what people hear when I preach. Over these 22 weeks, I thought I'd been doing some pretty good preaching. But not everybody thought so because they heard something I didn't say. So I'll just say it the best I know how. You won't go to heaven with bitterness in your heart. How can you misunderstand that? You won't go to heaven as an angry person. You won't go to heaven with sin in your life. You can't go to heaven if you hate your brother. Any color, any kind. You can't go to heaven if Jesus is not Lord of your life. You can't go to heaven if you would rather have Jesus than anything else in this world. You can't go. You can fake it. You can play church. You can come like this all you want to and act like you're praying. You can have fellowship with people and do this all you want to. But until Christ Jesus the Lord does a mighty work in your heart and your hands can open and you can stand before him justified and stand before each other with a compassionate heart, you won't go to heaven. But if you kneel at the foot of the cross and you ask him to forgive you and cleanse you and change you, that's exactly what he will do. He's already made the provision for it. All you have to do is believe. Forget Satan. He's defeated. Just don't let him have any influence in you. Keep yourself pure before the Lord. Keep your mind on him. Whatsoever things are pure and just and holy and good and have a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things and the God of peace will keep you until that day. Can I get an amen? I mean a real amen from anybody. Stand up with me, please. I have to ask, does this make sense to anybody? Does this make any kind of sense? Folks, we are living in the last days. Jesus is coming. I'm desperate. I'm convicted. I'm convinced. I told, now I got a couple of minutes. I can expound here. I've already told the staff and I told the council in a prayer meeting. I am fully prepared to lose people now. I am fully prepared for people to be dissatisfied with the fact that I'm only preaching Jesus and the cross. I will never preach another thing. I will never preach what you want me to preach, whoever you are. I will never preach to make you happy. I will never preach to keep you coming. If you come here, they're going to sing about Jesus, and I'm going to preach Jesus Christ, Him crucified, buried, raised from the dead, and coming back again. That is what you're going to hear. So I would ask you today, as we close, let's, let's lift up our hands. If, if you can, can you open yours? You don't have a fist in one of them, do you? If you do, ask Jesus to help you right now. Ask him to help you to open it wide so you can stand before him naked, accepted, faithful. Dear God, we come to you again. We recognize that it is so very easy to become influenced by our surroundings. And the death that's in the air, we can start breathing it and give off the scent of death. The, the confusion and the depression, it's all around us. And as we take it in, Lord, it's so possible to have an aroma of death. But I pray this morning that we will begin once again 
to understand that we are to breathe the breath of God, have the life of God in us, the Word of God abounding in us and bearing fruit in us. Let it happen, Lord. Let us crave holiness, righteousness, peace. Let us recognize you didn't die just so people could get their way. You died and rose again so you could be glorified. People could be set free from everything that besets them. And so Christ, with open hands, we say, bless your name, bless your name, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me, Forgive us of our sins, of our transgressions, of our iniquities, of our rebellion, of our hard-headedness. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for any root of bitterness or anger that we have in us. Set us free. Deliver us from that which would enslave us, O oh God. May we walk in the love of God and remember love never fails. We count it done in Jesus' name. And the whole church said amen. amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for coming. Remember next Sunday, we'll do it again, God willing. You got to go online and register at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it starts at 10, okay? But I want you to leave in peace. Leave knowing that he abides. And that if the trumpet were to sound right now, you would go to meet him. How many of you have that hope? Do you have that hope? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. Bye-bye for today. We'll see you next time unless Jesus comes.